Welcome, everybody. Uh, hope you had a great summer. For those of if they're guests here, my name is Tyler Spring, and this is our first uh, meeting for the, the Concord Business Partnership of this 23-24 season. So um, welcome here. We've got a great workshop today, and it was sort of born out of a meeting that um, happened last spring. We were trying to figure out how energy efficiency worked with our, with our membership and our ownerships of these commercial buildings in town. So um, I'm excited that this panel here is going to give us some content. Hopefully we can get some education here and, and put it to work in our, in our buildings and, and um, be a nice uh, education for us. So um, I've got a couple of housekeeping items here to, to clear up. Um, we've got a, um, hopefully everyone saw this flyer, but these three dates uh, for the next three months are our meetings coming up. We have our annual meeting October 4th. That's um, next, uh, let's see, uh, 530 at the Colonial Inn across the street here. That'll be um, our annual meeting. If anybody has any interest joining the board or has um, uh, any um, interest of content for our, for our board meeting coming up after this meeting that wants to talk about um, if there's priorities that you think we should uh, hit up, please let us know after this meeting because we will be meeting right afterwards and following that. So we have, um, we have a couple um, we're launching this Deborah Stark Award. I don't know if everybody knows Deborah Stark. Hopefully you got this flyer on the, on the, uh, the award, but that's gonna be launched. We, she was near and dear to our group and everybody thought she was um, just a wonderful person and, and we felt like this award was um, something that we wanted to give back to our, our group here. So we'll be taking nominees um, as early as this fall. We'll be introducing the award in the springtime. So if anybody has uh, thoughts on that, please let um, our Jen, myself, or uh, anybody on, on the board know about a candidate that might be um, part of that, that group. And then um, we have a, our, Jen sent out our membership directory. We're gonna add uh, profiles for our group. We're up to 43 members now. So 38 years back. 43, so we're adding a, a really good group here, and uh, we just like people to know who, who you are. So by um, adding your profile in, we'll get that up on the website. And then um, I think we have um, guests today. Do we have any guests that I need to introduce? Eve. Oh, Eve Eisenberg. Eve. So Eve, Eve Eisenberg, she's over at Inkstone Architects. Eve, and do you want to quickly say hello about your, your company? or? <laughs> so Patrick's with Renew as part of our, our panel here. Um, and then I guess, um, obviously, we'd love to hear from Carrie. I don't know if Carrie's, is Carrie here? She must be skirting in quick, so we okay. can go with Mimi. Or Megan or Mimi. Me me Do you have any quick updates? like I'm giving public testimony now. I live at 833. Um, I think you're being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm the economic vitality manager for the town. A couple of the big updates is our food truck uh, new policy procedure is now up and running. So we've been doing uh, calls out to some of the mobile food vendors that have already done work with the town of Concord or have, have been operating in the town of Concord on sort of one day licenses to encourage them to become approved vendors for the town. Uh, we've got a couple of those businesses taking us up on the offer and they're being inspected and they will be on the list. So then anybody who's doing a, a public or private event are welcome to work with those businesses and it's just a simple like, I've invited Northeast Barbecue to come to my event, and we're like, hooray for you. And we just keep track to make sure that we're not being any spot that doesn't have um, trucks more than 52 days a year uh, to be in compliance. We are working to recruit a truck to be behind the visitor center on Thursday nights um, through October as a way of helping support some of the evening tours that we're doing to take advantage of the autumnal colors in the um, neighborhood. 
Um, I've just finished a business inventory. Um, so I've got some stats that'll be rolling out about the business mix here in the town um, and are at the final stages of my uh, sewer improvement fee um, sort of analysis to sort of look at what are the trends and um, what kind of learnings we might be able to uh, potentially make some adjustments because I know that that's been a burden for a number of commercial um, property owners and businesses. Um, and I'm starting to look at how to support some business clusters. Um, so I'll be putting in a grant next week to support age-friendly business districts. Um, so that's not quite ADA compliance, but it's to be more friendly to folks that have are over 65 that might have vision impairments or just be a little slower, might need mobility aids or just all, it, it just helps accessibility in general. So it will be looking at best practices. Um, there's a number of communities like Boston that are doing this. So um, it'll be working one-on-one -on -one with the businesses to think about how can you do your displays better? How could you make your entrance a little more accessible for people to enter? Maybe you want to turn the music down a little bit. Maybe you want the print to be a little bit bigger on your menus, all those kind of things. Um, and then supporting public service. And then kind of apropos to today's uh, theme is looking at the cluster of green businesses and how can Concord lean more into that identity to recruit um, more of the ecosystem of businesses working in that field. Um, so if anybody's interested in any of those, I'd love to kind of connect and, and uh, work with you. Thanks. Thanks, baby. I understand traffic's a little rough out there. Sorry, <coughs> Megan's just showing up right at this moment. Hi, Megan. So we'll okay, proceed. great, great. Well, yeah, and for people that don't know, Megan, our deputy town manager just arrived, and, and I don't know, Megan, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I don't know if you have any other exciting news to share. Uh, I'm missing the update, um, but <clears throat> I'm hoping that there's some kind of transition. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Hi. Hi everyone, I'm Megan Zamuda. I'm the Deputy Town Manager. I'm sorry I'm running a little late today. But I'm happy to be here. Um, you know, we're starting our budgeting season, so that's something that happens every year, and um, we're picking up on that right now. Um, we're hiring some key positions in town. We have um, an HR position, HR Director, Chief Financial Officer, and Council on Aging Director positions that we're currently recruiting for and interviewing, starting to interview for. So that's exciting. And I think that's all I have right now. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So maybe touched on the food trucks. I was just going to say food trucks. Okay. We talked about food trucks. So, and then maybe we'll wrap up with Carrie, but um, that's all I have for business uh, updates from the group here. We've got um, Eric, if you want to start your, your program here. Eric is our sustainability director. And again, we heard from him earlier in the spring. And, and out of, that, out of that meeting, we figured this workshop would be helpful for our group. We know that Taurus, Chris Gray over here with Taurus is energizing his 300 Baker Ave building with all new um, high, high efficiency. He's gonna chat about sort of that case study, but Eric is also gonna give us an update of how, how we can you know, be more efficient with our buildings in town here. So the floor is yours. Yeah, yeah. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Um, I know we have an ambitious agenda this morning, so I'll, I'll keep my comments pretty brief. Uh, I just want to thank you all for being here, and I wanted to thank the partnership for continuing to have a dialogue on, on um, these important topics of energy efficiency and electrification. Um, these are certainly important issues to the town, uh, and you all play an important role in that uh, with helping us reach our goals. So we're at a pretty exciting point. There's a lot of momentum around these topics. Uh, technologies are rapidly expanding and evolving. Uh, costs are beginning to come down in many cases with some of these technologies. And this is all helping to accelerate adoption, which is all good news. And we'll hear some more about that, as Tyler just mentioned, from, from Chris, um, specifically with what's happening at the 300 Baker Avenue. Um, and we also have Laura Scott from the Light Plan, who's going to give us a little perspective on the light plant um, as they're looking forward at, at electrification across the town. Uh, it's also exciting because there's never been a better time for financial incentives related to uh, these particular efforts. Uh, local, state, and federal incentives have never been more generous and can really make meaningful contributions uh, to reducing the costs that are associated with investing in, in electrification. Uh, and we'll hear some more about those options um, shortly from uh, some of my colleagues, other colleagues, Jan, um, at the light plant, 
and Chandra, who's with National Grid, uh, who's here today to share some information from them. Um, it may not surprise you that energy use in buildings is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the town, about 65%, uh, and commercial and industrial sector make up about half of that. Um, so there's definitely a, a role to play. And while we realize that we can't change that overnight, we do need to move the needle on electrification if we want to be able to reach our goals as a town um, and as a state in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, and moving towards electrification. Um, although it's important to look back at the past, I'm, I'm really hoping that, that today and, and moving forward, we'll really be focused on the present and the future. Um, it's no, no surprise to anyone here that, that we're really seeing the impacts of, of climate change right now. Um, just in recent months, we've seen a few instances here in town of very intense storm events, including last Friday, um, where we're getting really large amounts of precipitation, high winds, um, and that's going to be moving more and more towards the norm with, with having these uh, increased frequency and intensity of storm events. And, you know, although that storm last Friday moved through pretty quickly, it, it certainly left impacts on the town um, in, in a number of ways, everything from flooding and trees down, disrupting transportation, uh, power outages, you know, and these are all things that, that we need to be able to be prepared to deal with. Um, and, and, and even more globally, you know, this year we're looking at uh, this summer being the hottest recorded summer um, on, on the planet. Last eight years have been the hottest recorded eight years on the planet. Um, and the next five years are actually expected to continue to break records uh, for heat. So it all sounds pretty discouraging, but it's just, again, kind of reinforcing the point that, that this is here, this is happening, and you know, we can't, can't close our eyes to it. Um, so having said that, uh, I hope that the, the community that the partnership represents will continue to see the town as a resource um, in terms of, of helping you position yourselves to be resilient to these changes um, and help us both meet our goals. So we're here to help. Um, so with that, I think I'll, I'll stop talking and uh, we can move forward with getting our program started and, and hearing from our presenters. Um, so with that, I think I'll turn things over to, to Chris and let him share uh, what's happening over at 300 Baker Avenue. Thanks so much, Eric. Uh, so again, good morning. Thank you all for your time. I'm Chris Gray. Um, I lead Renew Communities. We are a subsidiary of the owner of 300 Baker, Taurus Investment Holdings. Uh, some of you may know or remember Peter Merrigan, our CEO, who's attended uh, this group quite a few times. Uh, but he is very excited about what we're doing at 300 Baker um, as his retrofit subsidiary. Renew Communities was set up to deal with existing buildings. We don't get to build the the brand new energy efficient net zero buildings, we get to take the buildings that are already here and make those more efficient, which I think is a, is a harder task uh, because we have to deal with what the buildings give us. Um, <clears throat> 300 Baker is, is quite an old building built back in the 50s uh, that we wanted to come in and create an as sustainable of a future building as possible after our retrofits. We've been looking at it for uh, a little over two years now. My partner, uh, Patrick Jansen, spends most of his time working on that building and some others in Newton, some other office buildings that we're working on. Um, and the, the, this is a complicated building. Um, this is a 400,000 plus square foot building, so it might not be directly applicable to your buildings, but the process that we went through is what I want to show you and the results of the outcome and really the, the depth of an analysis that it takes to get to these uh, deep energy retrofits that we're doing. Um, so I want you to focus not so much on the systems, but the process that we used at 300 Baker. So our process really does not change regardless of the asset type. Renew Communities works with multifamily, office, and industrial buildings. And it really all starts with a comprehensive analysis of what's going on in the building. Understanding its operations, understanding its energy consumption historically, and then diving into all of the energy usage systems to understand where that energy is going so that we can start to formulate a plan of where our energy dollars, our investment is best spent to improve the energy efficiency of that building. We then go through a full design and uh, costing study to figure out 
where we're going to spend our dollars and then we formulate that into a formal plan. We work with our investors in the building, we work with our lenders on the building, we work with the asset management of the building to then formulate a plan to implement. Once we've done that, we want to track and trend the energy consumption over the long term to validate what we've, been, what we've done in the building and validate the investment. And so we want to start with our goals, formulate the plan, and then track and trend to make sure that we're hitting that plan after implementation. So in general, for office buildings, we focus on first reduction, and then we focus on application of renewable energy after reduction. Uh, but the reduction comes in the form of mostly HVAC systems and lighting for office buildings. The mechanical systems in office buildings are the largest consumer of energy, followed by lighting. Um, and so we evaluate what's going on in the building. We also look at the envelope. Uh, so for example, in buildings in the south where we have uh, black roofs, we might look at replacing those with white roofs so that we reflect that energy. In the northeastern climates, we might want a darker roof so that we absorb that energy because you're mostly heating. So we go through full engineering analysis of every component of the building to determine what can feasibly be done with an existing building, but then also what is best for that building in that climate. Um, a lot of times the design and the layout of the building will really change the energy demand of the building. But once it's built, we can't do anything about that. Architects will help work with their client to understand the size and orientation of the building and how that might impact the energy consumption, but once it's there, we, we have to deal with the envelope the way it is, uh, or we have to deal with the layout the way it is, and we can look at improving that envelope. Uh, after we look at energy consumption, we also want to step into water consumption as well. We want to reduce water as much as energy. So in office buildings, we focus on the internal water usage from laboratories and fixtures, uh, but we also focus on the irrigation system. Around 300 Baker, there's a lot of different zones, a lot of green space where we have irrigations. We actually installed a smart irrigation system that monitors the moisture of the ground and only waters when we need that water to make sure that we're not wasting it, make sure we don't get runoff from an oversaturated ground. Uh, and then we follow that up with communicating with our tenants, right? Understanding what their ESG goals are, understanding what their energy goals for their space are and how we can help meet those over the uh, time that they're in our building and make sure that we have green lease language, which allows us to capture data from them and data from their space so that we can track and trend the carbon footprint of our buildings. Uh, and then we pursue uh, certifications of our buildings, regardless of, of where they are, we pursue some sort of green certification. And that changes with the asset type and the location. Uh, with office buildings, we look at things like Green Globes and Energy Star to make sure that, again, we're tracking that, improving the energy upgrades. So for 300 Baker specifically, I mentioned it's uh, over 400,000 square foot building, very large building, uh, one of the largest loads in this, uh, in this town. So it's a, for the MLP, I know it's a, it's a big uh, focus area. For us, it's one of our largest office buildings, so it's a large focus as well. Uh, but it was originally built in 1952 as an industrial building and then converted to an office building in 1980s. So that means we've got some pretty complicated systems because it was not designed as an office building. So uh, it took us quite a while to dig in and understand what was there and what we can conceivably do with a retrofit. Uh, you see the layout of the building here. It's a very uh, spread out building with a lot of arms that come off of it. Uh, so fairly complicated envelope design. Um, complicated orientations, and you've got very large built-up air handlers on the roof because, again, it was retrofitted to an office space and originally designed as an industrial building. So you have these very large boxes on top of the roof that serve different zones of the building, and that's where all of your HVAC energy exchange and your temperature change happens is on the roof in those big boxes, and then it goes into ductwork 
down and spread throughout the building. Um, so when we look at different buildings, we want to benchmark it against a, a line there that's a trend line from the carbon risk real estate monitor. It's a, a pretty common metric used in the real estate industry to track where a building is on the decarbonization curve with a goal of limiting climate change to one and a half degrees Celsius by 2050. Um, so that pathway tells us where we're trending on that line. You see it flatten out there after about 2031. And the reason it flattens out is because we know that the grid is getting greener at the same time that buildings are getting more efficient. So when those two lines cross where your grid has a, a low carbon intensity and the buildings become uh, less energy intensive, you then hit a carbon neutral state for your entire building. And there's an assumption across the country and across the globe that energy grids are gonna reach a certain limit of uh, renewable energy, which allows buildings to still use a certain amount of energy and not have to get all the way to net zero because the energy they're buying from the grid is uh, zero carbon as well. So everything has to work in unison. The buildings have to work with the grid, the grid have to work with buildings in order to reach this carbon neutral energy future. And then we've got transportation as well, right? All of the fossil fuels being consumed in transportation, which also has to work with the electric grid if we're gonna to go to all electric transportation. So it is very complicated, but I wanna kind of show you the way the real estate industry looks at our energy pathway with buildings. So the, the program that we have uh, scheduled at 300 Baker really looks at mechanical systems first and foremost. Those old 50 year old mechanical systems on the roof are um, ready for upgrades, right? That's where we're gonna get a lot of our energy savings, replacing coils and fans and, and heat exchangers, and then putting new controls on those systems to make sure that it understands what's happening in each of those boxes on the roof, but also communicating with the tenant spaces to understand how much heating and cooling and ventilation is actually needed. So you're not just brute force running the boxes on the roof, you're also, uh, monitoring what's happening in the space to make sure that you're only consuming as much energy as you need. And then uh, lighting throughout the building on a stage plan, uh, starting with the common area spaces, all the common areas already been upgraded to LED. And then we have tenant fit out specs. Every time a tenant changes their space, they have certain efficiency requirements they have to hit with their lighting and other systems in their space. And then capping that off with a solar system uh, basically blanketing the roof combined with battery storage to keep that energy from overloading the MLP system. So we'll have a 900 kW solar system backed up by an equivalent size battery storage system. So again, that'll happen in phases. Phase one will be half of the mechanical system. So two of the HVAC systems will be retrofitted at the controls added to those units as well as the rest of the building. The lighting is already completed throughout the common area spaces and then we'll walk through each tenant space as they roll and then the water upgrades have already been completed as well. Phase two will be the remainder of the HVAC systems and we're splitting that into phases really because of um, lender issues, right? So we all know what's happened with interest rates lately. Lenders have become uh, more hesitant to lend on office buildings. So we want to accomplish phase one first, get them comfortable with that, and then, um, and then attack phase two. And then the solar and battery storage will be going on in, in, um, at the same time in parallel with the phase one mechanical system. So again, that's a 900 kW PV system, blanketing all the free space on the roof. And then that'll be backed up with uh, a 720 kW AC. So it's balancing the AC output of the renewable energy and the AC battery storage will be matched. And uh, those will be deployed at the same time and give the building basically uh, three hours at peak capacity of energy supply. 
So if, the, if we're able to pull the load of the building down, we'll be able to deploy that battery and basically ride through any outage situation for longer than three hours. But uh, the battery storage there gives us the ability to not only keep from pushing energy back to the MLP, but it also allows us to have some backup and resiliency for our building to act as backup power. So a couple of benefits there. Now the, the energy impact, um, I think is fairly significant, but it might not be as significant as you would think. These are very expensive, very um, intrusive retrofits to a building, and we're able to ultimately achieve about 31% energy reduction. Now that's a lot, but it's nowhere near net zero, right? It's nowhere near zero energy buildings because buildings still use a significant amount of energy and there's only so much that we can control. Tenants still have plug loads, they still have computers, they still have their own lights, they still control a lot of the energy consumption of the building, but we're doing everything that we can from the common systems to reduce the energy consumption on the building. And then from an environmental impact, again, we see a reduction of about 784 tons of carbon uh, equivalency annually, dropping from a carbon footprint of about 1,800 tons annually to just over 1,000 after phase one, phase two, and the battery storage and renewable energy system is implemented. So that means on that pathway I showed you earlier, we go from our current state in 2023 where we're basically in line with the curve to we push out to compliance with the curve out to 2027. That's not that far out, right? But it still takes millions of dollars of investment to reach 30% energy savings, which only puts us out to 2027. Now we have to make sure that we follow through with our tenant fit out plan to upgrade their lighting, upgrade their spaces, to continue to see the energy savings to push us out to that 2031 time frame where we hit that plateau and we know that we've got a building that's as efficient as we need it to be to be compliant with the CRIM pathway. Um, so this retrofit, again, costs us millions of dollars, but it does yield a lot of benefits, right? We get 30% energy consumption, which is shared between us and the tenants. Um, so in office buildings, the costs of energy are passed through to the tenants, so they will realize $200,000 a year of savings on energy bills from the common area. Um, and then as they implement their own efficiency upgrades in their space, they'll see those energy benefits as well. We saved over 180,000 gallons a year of water, and again, uh, 786 tons of carbon. So it's a, it's a very impactful retrofit, but it takes a lot of time and a lot of planning to implement these types of energy improvements. Um, now again, our, our cost savings really are based on what we know today about energy rates, right? So we run sensitivity analysis on the savings to show what happens with energy rates of historical escalation what happens with standard annualized escalation, and then what happens with kind of worst case escalation, right? And so we, we look at the potential savings there over a long period of time uh, for our planning and our communication with our investors and our tenants as well. So that's an unknown. We don't know what energy rates are gonna do. Shane, I don't think you do either. Excuse me. No, I don't Laura, I don't think you do either. Uh, if, if you did, you know, I think we'd all be a little bit happier, but um, we have to understand how that impacts our payback, how that impacts our potential benefit as well. Uh, and then I mentioned that we back everything up with data. So we have an energy tracking system on the building that looks at the energy consumption of all the mechanical systems, looks at the demand of the building real time so that we can pull it up and understand where the energy is going for the different systems from lighting to pumps to fans um, in each of those large air handlers. So we think data is very important because if you just look at the energy bill on a, on a rearward looking basis, you have one data point and it's very hard to make energy decisions 
without having that granularity and that level of detail that you need. So we have, we partner with a company called DataQuip, which goes in and puts sensors throughout our building to capture that very detailed data. Um, so the, the project funding, uh, we are right now planning on funding this all out of cash, right? So our lenders, we mentioned the uh, lender environment. We originally wanted to pursue CPACE. We wanted to pursue lender advance funding. Well, the interest rate environments kind of made that all dried up, right? So we now have to pursue this with all cash, which means we have to split it into phases. Um, and we're kind of beholden to the markets and what they're doing. So we've pivoted a couple of different times on this project to make sure that we can still implement our stage strategy uh, while responding to the markets. Uh, but if the interest rates start to go back down, we will still go back and try to pursue CPACE and those other sources of funding. Uh, but I emphasize this because it's important to understand the uh, need for flexibility and really need to dig in and look at all of the different sources for funding, including utilities and um, incentive areas and uh, different funding mechanisms that some of the other panelists will talk about. So with that, I will see if there's any questions. Yes. I have a question. I was wondering, when you talked about $200,000 savings for the parents, um, I think thus far, phase one? No, that, that was $200,000 per year for the project, right? For the whole project. So do you have a breakdown as to what percentage of that savings would be that due to your HVAC improvements, what percentage? Yeah, we certainly Sorry. do. And I can, you want me to I, repeat that? I can follow back up with you on that. I don't have it with me right now, but yes, we do have that breakdown. Sorry, you said yes? I said we do have that breakdown. I don't have it with me right now. I can follow back up on that. Um, it, it was in the presentation on a high level with the breakdown from each of the different components on that bar, stack bar chart there. But uh, yeah, I can follow back up with you on the details. Yeah. Uh, really appreciate it, uh, Chris. Thanks for the overview. I guess my question is for CMLP and Chris. Um, so one interesting thing that stuck out to me was the standby, the backup power, um, the storage. And um, my understanding is that that's a big part of our grid sort of future is peak shaving and demand management. And so I'm curious, I, I could be ignorant here, but I think CMLP's rate structure is really straightforward and simple. Is there any peak shaving incentive in Concord where we're looking at, you know, structuring a rate to actually incentivize building owners to cut their peak power? Thanks for the question. Um, so medium and large commercial customers like the 300 Baker Avenue property have a pretty significant demand fee with their rate, not small commercial, but medium and large. And so to the extent they're able to shave their non-coincident peak, um, that's a direct savings on the bill. Uh, smaller buildings that don't have a demand fee um, wouldn't have that same incentive. But I'm gonna talk a little bit more about maybe another route where savings could be achieved um, from battery storage for small customers. Thanks. Uh, good morning, thank you. Just uh, very briefly, have you considered uh, solar canopies at all in a parking lot? Thank you. Yeah, we have looked at solar canopies and we, we're actually deploying solar canopies on some of our other projects. It really comes down to the economic evaluation, right? So solar canopies are roughly 50% more expensive to build than rooftop because you have to have a structure. You have to do the, uh, the structural work uh, to build a canopy. It is a fully engineered system to be able to stand up um, uh, any, any type of cantilever system or any type of can canopy system. And so when you use the rooftop, you already have a structure there. We've done the structural analysis on the building to show that it can hold it so we don't have to build anything else. Uh, 
Typically, canopies can make sense in areas with, with differing energy economics, but it can also make sense in areas where you can charge for that premium parking. Uh, 300 Baker is not one where we think we can do that, and so we're just looking at rooftop. The solar smart program in Massachusetts used to provide extra incentives for the canopies. That I guess that didn't really level out that you've looked into that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll let uh, some of the other panelists touch on the smart, the smart program, and we are taking advantage of that in other areas and doing canopy systems in other areas that participate in smart, but uh, it's not applicable in, in this particular market. Okay, I think uh, for the sake of time, we'll probably pause on questions. Um, I, once we're finished with our presentations, we'll have an opportunity for a more open Q&A session. Um, but it, at this point, I think we'll move on to, uh, we'll thank Chris uh, for, that, for that presentation. Uh, and we'll move on to um, our next speakers. Uh, I think we just need to reconnect a, a laptop here. Um, and uh, next up, we'll have Laura Scott, who's with the Municipal Light Plant Leadership. And she's gonna take a few minutes to talk about um, sort of looking forward with increased electrification in the town and what the light plant has been thinking and planning with regards to that. Good morning, everyone. I'm really glad to be here and so glad that you have taken the time to come and talk about energy, a very important topic in today's world. Uh, it's going to take Jan a minute to get our presentation um, online, but I'll say just a couple of words first. Um, I'm going to go through the, my slides fairly quickly because we do have a compressed time frame this morning. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions either after today's presentation or Jan is going to show our contact information. And if anybody wants to follow up one-on-one, -on -one, I'd be happy to come meet with you, talk with you on the phone, answer your individual questions. Um, based on your knowledge of where you're at. It's hard to address a, a large group of people with some having more detailed knowledge of the energy markets and some less. So um, happy to follow up. Oops. Oops. Okay. So uh, first thing I want to mention is um, Concord Municipal Light does in fact have a strategic plan. Um, not everyone may be aware of it, but we've been working for a number of years on energy efficiency, uh, solar, electrification, and capital improvements to the system. Um, in recent years, we just implemented a modern uh, computer information system um, that will allow our customers uh, more choice and control over their energy and water usage. And uh, it also is a prerequisite for our next project, which we are undertaking as we speak, which is installing, replacing all of the meters in the field. So each one of your businesses is going to get a new meter, as will all the residential um, homes in town. Uh, this is a foundation for everything that's going to come forward. These new meters are going to enable us to um, adopt different rate design that can help uh, um, improve the economics for electrification. Uh, it also is going to improve our uh, reliability um, because we will have much better visibility of our system. Today, we actually wait for people to call us to tell us they're out of power. We don't have visibility. We don't have our endpoints talking back to us saying, hey, I'm out over here. And this new, these new meters are going to do that. They can talk to, to us as well as us talk to them. And so... Um, very important part of our foundational uh, direction that we're going in. We spent a lot of money over the last five years uh, promoting heat pumps and EVs. Um, this is part of a larger strategy to help the town reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the idea is basically to switch as much fossil fuel use, both from transportation and space heating and cooling, uh, to electric uses, to electric uh, technology, and then green the power supply, so that all the power is coming from non-carbon emitting sources. It starts a little busy, and uh, I'm not going to go through all of it, but the basic takeaway is that this year, 2023, is the first year that we expect 100% of the electricity that we purchase to serve the town um, will, in fact, be carbon-free. 
those solid bars uh, over time, like the blue, green, orange, and pink, those represent um, sources of energy where we're buying <clears throat> directly from a wind or solar or hydro uh, power generator that comes with renewable energy certificates and then retiring those certificates. The blue overlay that you see, it says 42% uh, in 2018 and going up to 52% uh, in 21 and 22. Those are non-associated renewable energy certificates that we've been buying in addition to the physical power that we source directly in order to offset our emissions. So you can see in 2021, we were about 85% non uh, carbon free because the total bar leads up to 85%. And in 2022, we were 96%. And this year, 2023, you can see the blue bar just go over the 100% mark. That means we've achieved non carbon emitting status for our power supply. I've had a number of questions and I was asked to address this morning um, the CMLP's infrastructure and our ability to handle uh, more electrification. And I need to describe a little bit about how the distribution system, how we get our power. So we're not directly connected to the regional New England grid. The power supply, all the generators are connected to this grid except our, our local solar. Um, and power flows from the regional transmission system, uh, not directly to CMLP, but through an intermediary. It's um, an utility whose lines uh, and wires are in between us and the grid. And we pay them to transmit the power uh, to CMLP service territory. They are required to deliver all of CMLP's needs up to a maximum of 60 megawatts. Once the power gets to the local CMLP system, we actually have our local uh, transformers and wires are capable of delivering about 70 megawatts to the buildings and residences in town. So, you know, if we were to start to bump up against our, if we needed more power, one of the first things we would do is go back to Eversource and ask for more transmission capability. Um, because locally, we don't need to add anything to the grid. Now, where are we now? Uh, in 2023, our peak was 38 megawatts. So if you compare that to 70, we currently have 32 megawatts of excess capacity. So our challenge on the system is not absorbing more load. Um, it's actually something Chris mentioned earlier, which is accepting more solar during certain hours of the day. So what can 32 megawatts get us? Um, by my estimates, uh, 32 megawatts of excess capacity could supply uh, five to 10,000 electric vehicles if they were charged simultaneously, if they all charged at exactly the same time during our peak, um, or 32 to 64,000 if they were charged under a managed program where CMLP charges certain ones during certain hours and others during other hours and it's spread out. Um, there's a big range there because some uh, vehicles are full battery electric and have a, a larger uh, capability to receive larger amounts of electricity and some are plug-in hybrids. Um, so depending on what type of EV you're talking about, that's why there's a range. Um, 32 megawatts alternatively could supply about 8,000 heat pumps. So right now, this, we don't have a problem absorbing more load. We can take more EVs, we can take more heat pumps for quite a while. Um, Okay, so uh, on to rates. One of the questions I've been asked is, for residential customers in the town, they pay on a tiered system, where the more they use, the higher the per kilowatt hour fee becomes. So for the first about 650 kilowatt hours, you pay the lowest rate, and there's another rate for the next 178, and then for everything above that eight, 850, you pay the highest rate. And people have said, well, hey, that doesn't really work for electrification because if I'm going to add a car and a bunch of heat pumps, I'm going to end up in that third tier. And that seems like a punishment for having done the right thing. Um, so for residential customers, the plan is to shift everyone to a, what we call a time of use rate. And they can be designed differently. It hasn't been determined yet. It's still being discussed. But what I think is the most likely is probably a three-tiered system 
where you have one period of the day, usually it's late afternoon, early evening, that's the most expensive. You wanna to try to avoid using electricity then. Um, three to seven in the summer, more like four to eight in the winter. Then you have a super off-peak period with the lowest rate. Um, that's when you want, would wanna charge cars, um, batteries, and anything that's an elective uh, use of energy, dishwashers or washing machines. And then the rest of the time would be sort of a mid-peak period um, where the price would be in between the super peak and the super off peak. And we think that this will work for residential customers. Many of them do have some discretionary load and they will see savings from what they're currently paying um, if they are able to shift any of their load. Because when the rate comes out, it's gonna be what we call revenue neutral. It doesn't collect any more money than the current rates. And the rate is set based on what people's sort of average use is during these periods. So the, to the extent that you're able to reduce during those uh, periods from what you did before, you will see savings. Now there's been discussion about whether or not this type of rate structure would be appropriate for businesses. Currently, small businesses in Concord um, don't pay a tiered rate. They pay one uh, capacity fee for all electricity used. That's small com commercial customers. The large ones, um, as we said, have a demand fee component along with the volumetric. And I'd love to know from you all here today as business owners, um, particularly the small business folks, do you think that a time of use rate structure would, be, would help you save money? Would you be able to uh, move any of your load between these time periods? Because if so, then we could certainly look at a similar rate design for the commercial customers. Um, but right now, you can adopt heat pumps and EVs as small commercial customers, and you won't be penalized because you don't pay a tiered rate. It's just the residences that are currently under that rate design. So um, we'd love to get some feedback on that question. P please feel free to contact me um, to talk more about uh, anything power supply and or rates related. Great, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, I think we'll just hold off on questions for now, if you don't mind, just so we can uh, try to keep on track. We have uh, two more presenters. We have uh, Janicetti from the Light Plant, who's going to talk a little bit uh, about uh, rebates and incentives that are available um, to the community. Uh, and following her will be Chandra Bilski from National Grid, who will talk about some of the National Grid rebates and incentives. Thank you. And I'm here with my colleague, Pamela Cady who some of you may have spoken with or may speak with in the future. So to start with two bits of big picture information on behalf of CMLP and National Grid. So National Grid is a sponsor of Mass Save, a statewide organization that provides energy efficiency and electrification services and rebates to gas, uh, gas customers who are customers of National Grid, who are electric customers of Eversource, Cape Light Compact, Unitil, the big utilities around the state. Uh, CMLP is not affiliated with MassSave. We are the community-owned uh, community electric utility for the town of Concord. We develop and administer our own programs. However, you will see that we sometimes copy MassSave's programs because we want to offer uh, similar programs to companies, businesses here in town that heat water and space with oil, propane, or electricity. So the other big picture item is that the agency that provides you with some services and rebates will depend on your current heating fuel. So if you heat your building with oil, electricity, or propane, CMLP would be happy to provide you with a building energy assessment that can help you identify measures that will reduce both your monthly energy bills and your carbon emissions. If you heat your building with natural gas, Mass Save would be happy to provide you with a building energy assessment for the same purpose. Mass Save is currently offering uh, weatherization rebates for gas heating businesses. CMLP does not offer those to oil, electric, or propane heating customers at this time. We hope to at some point in the future. Uh, Mass Save offers rebates for high efficiency gas fired boilers and furnaces. Both Mass Save and CMLP offer rebates for businesses who are planning to switch from their current heating fuel to electrically powered heat pumps. 
This is a case where we copied MassSave's program, and so both MassSave and CMLP offer the same heat pump rebate amounts per ton of cooling capacity of the equipment that you install. The heat pump rebate amount depends on the type of heat pump equipment that you install. CMLP does have a rebate cap of $50,000 in any given three-year period. It is my understanding that MassSave does not have that cap, that in fact these uh, rebate amounts per ton apply up to at least 150 tons of cooling capacity for equipment. There are other opportunities, either from MassSave or from CMLP, that are based on, on your current equipment fuel. Uh, MassSave offers uh, rebates for gas-fired, high-efficiency uh, water heating equipment. They also offer rebates if you're switching from gas water heating to heat, electrically powered heat pump water heaters. CMLP offers rebates for electric heat pump water heaters for any business that's switching from oil, electric, or propane fired water heating. MassSave also offers uh, rebates for efficient gas fired food service equipment or for switching to electrically powered induction cooktops, infrared or infrared conveyor broilers. Uh, for the last two items, we uh, have agreed that it's important to check with uh, Anthony Carloni, who you'll see the contact information later he's at here National Grid. Oh, he's here. Yes. Oh, thank you, Anthony. I didn't realize you were you had joined us. Um, to just confirm rebate eligibility before purchasing equipment. So for all of CMLP's commercial electric customers, CMLP offers some rebates that are available to all of you. Uh, we offer rebates for lighting upgrades. Often that is upgrading from older fluorescent lighting to efficient LED lighting. We offer rebates for solar panels. And we also offer rebates for level two EV charging stations. And CMLP's Charging station rebate can be combined with rebates from the state's mass EVIP program. And together, those two rebate programs can cover 50% or more of the cost, of the eligible cost of a typical $30,000 dual port EV charging station. Uh, Pre-approval is required for either CMLP's rebate or and mass EVIP's rebate before installation. Pamela? Pre-approval is actually required for all, for everything listed ah. there. Okay, good point. Regarding the EV charging stations, we are fortunate that CMLP is able to offer uh, EV support services we fund uh, Energy New England, a partner organizations, EV specialists to provide, at no cost to you, uh, help uh, understanding uh, how on-site EV charging can benefit your company, understand how to be smart about investing in EV charging on your site, and they can also help you prepare those pre-approval requests for not only CMLP's charging station rebate program, but also the state's mass EVIP program. They are, the EV specialists are also available to help you get up to speed, understanding the basics of EVs and charging. No question is too basic. They are willing to you know, start with you from zero, take you to 60, um, help you find electric vehicles that meet your business's needs if you're looking to convert your fleet. And uh, just answer any question you have, help you along your, your journey of purchasing EVs or charging stations. If you're the type of person who would like to do a little homework first before formulating your questions, we have developed some online uh, background EV resources that are available at the link here. If you are a small business in Concord that heats with oil, propane, or electric heat, if you're a storefront, a converted residential building, or a two to four unit, multi-unit office building, 
CMLP also funds another partner organization, Abode Energy Management, to provide you with coaching to help you figure out if heat pumps are the right solution to heat and cool your business and to help you navigate the heat pump installation process from specifying equipment to uh, comparing quotes, understanding the pros and cons of each, et cetera, et cetera. And both the EV support service that I mentioned a moment ago and this service, they are supported by CMLP funds. The technical experts that will help you are not affiliated with any particular installers or manufacturers. They are funded by us to provide you, provide you with impartial information. This slide deck, which we believe will be provided to you um, for your reference, contains some additional information, some additional details on CMLP's energy assessments for buildings heated with oil, propane, and electricity in terms of costs, in terms of how the process works. I'm not going to go over that now. Uh, and this slide uh, provides you with contact information for the town staff that you've heard from so far. Depending on the topic that you're interested in, we're happy to help you to help answer any questions you might have. And I will now turn this over to Chandra Bilski to talk about National Grid's programs and services. Thanks, Jan. So I'm Chandra Bilski. I am on the National Grid Energy Efficiency Team, the sales team. Um, so, you know, we can help you out with their gas energy efficiency. I also have Nick Wojcik here. Um, he is on, he's my engineer that works on my team. We also have Riley here, who is part of the energy efficiency team. She handles more of the medium-sized customers. We have Anthony Carloni, um, who works on our electrification projects. And then we have Michael McDonald, who is on our Future of Heat team. So I just want to give everyone a shout out. Thank you all for attending with us today. Um, so we just wanted to kind of go over the different um, programs. I know we're kind of um, strapped for time, so I'll be quick. And Jan covered a lot of it. We, you know, offer a lot of the same things. <clears throat> so for the upstream program, we do have um, some incentives that are provided when you make the purchase uh, at a distributor. So we have a, a link in this um, presentation that will also bring you to like let you know what you can get and where you can get those uh, different incentive um, at the distributor. So we also have the small business program. So this is geared towards customers who are using less than 75,000 therms annually. Um, there's a direct install vendor option. You can use your own vendors as well, but this also just provides you with kind of like a turnkey. And we use Energy Source as the name of the provider for that in this town. Um, and then we have the large commercial and industrial um, program, which is where I work in that space as well as Nick. Um, and so we provide uh, retrofit and new construction options. So if you're going to be installing something new or if, you're, um, if it's completely brand new or if it's like something that you're going to change out, something you have existing that's old, you want to put in a new one, piece of equipment, just reach out to us and we can let you know what incentive we can provide for that. Um, and then we have custom and prescriptive pathways. So what that means is just prescriptive, it's a set amount that we know ahead of time what we can provide for like a boiler or something like that. Um, but if it's something outside of that, we also have a custom program. So we can, you know, get some information from you, and then we have engineers that can calculate the savings, and then we can determine what the incentive will be for that. Um, and then we have new construction and major renovation. We have a group dedicated to that. So if you have a brand new building that you're going to be, um, you know, putting up, sounds like maybe that's not really happening around here. It's more like major renovation. Well, we can also take a look at that, too, and we have a whole team dedicated to that. Um, that's over 10,000 square feet, and we can point you in the right direction if you have that op opportunity. Um, so I just went through some gas measure examples. So pipe and tank insulation, right now we're promoting this measure and we're covering 75% of the cost of the project. So the stipulation is that it has to be done by the end of the year. That doesn't mean that we won't be providing incentives for pipe and tank insulation outside of that. If it's gonna pour into next year, that's fine. You just would probably get more like the 50% level covered rather than the 75 that we're doing right now. Um, also air sealing, condensing, domestic water heaters, boilers, retro commissioning, heat recovery, um, combustion controls, steam trap repairs, and others. So if you don't see it here, it doesn't mean we don't provide it. You just need to reach out to us and we can let you know what incentive level we have for whatever measure you're doing. Um, and then heat pumps and electrification. So as Jan mentioned, we're mirroring um, rates, incentive rates for that. And um, this is really, you know, a large focus for us right now. So we have pretty significant incentives. See those three different um, 
different rates depending on which type you're putting in. And then we have custom measures outside of that. So if you're a process customer and you're gonna be you know, changing or you have the ability or opportunity to change out something that is gas driven to electric, we have you know, uh, incentives for that. And we also have engineering support available for that. Um, and that's where Nick's gonna come in and talk about that. Great, thanks Chandra. Um, so uh, I'm Nick Wojcik, I work at the uh, engineering team here at National Grid and um, there's a couple different pathways you can go, like Chandra said, with uh, if you have a gas savings project. Um, you know, we have the prescriptive pathway that Chandra touched on. We also have the custom pathway, so it might fall outside of the realm of what's listed on the mass save form. Um, and that would come to us, uh, we would calculate the savings for you and Chandra would assign, assign a, an incentive for that. Um, there's a tool that, that all of MassSave has to use, it's called our benefit cost analysis. So really what we do is we plug in the cost of the project and the savings, both gas and electric, that we would realize from that project and just has to pass that screening in order to receive an incentive. Um, so we'll work with you on that if you do fall into that bucket. Um, we also provide what we call our um, MRD document, which is minimum requirements. And basically what it just says is, we're, we will offer you this incentive if you meet this criteria. So it will say maybe the make and model number of that specific equipment, uh, how it's supposed to operate, maybe certain temperatures, um, time of year, stuff like that. Um, the one neat thing is we do offer, um, we, you know, some people call them energy assessments. Uh, we call them scoping studies. But basically what that is is we can have, we have a list of about a dozen vendors that can come into your facility uh, that's covered at 100%, um, so there's no cost to you. They'll walk through your facility and identify what those uh, energy savings opportunities are. I mean, I think that's always the tough spot is, you know, you might want, you know, you have an older building or, you know, it's not really efficient, but where do you start? This could be a great avenue for you there. Um, and then w once those measures are identified, you might have a menu of options, um, maybe, you know, 10 or 12 options to pick from maybe two or three make more sense for you. Uh, at that point, we would dive into a more, uh, what we call our technical assistance study, where we might come in and do some metering on equipment um, to really dive into what those savings will um, be realized on your bill. And we do a 50-50 cost share uh, with the customer for that. And then this is just contact information for all of us. Um, and then there's some energy efficiency program links um, but basically, and there's also the general inbox. So basically, if you don't know who to reach out to, just go to the general inquiry box. You can reach out to any one of us on this list and we'll direct you to the right person. But we just want you to know that the programs are out here and available and it doesn't hurt to ask. We might say, no, it doesn't qualify, but please you know, reach out to us and ask and we'll help you out if we can. Hey, great, I'd like to just take a second to thank all of our presenters uh, for all their information. Uh, I'd also like to thank them for being concise. We are on time, which is terrific. Uh, and it's my understanding that uh, we'll have an opportunity now for uh, some, some Q&A. So if uh, folks have any questions, our panelists are, are welcome to, to try to answer those for you.